I believe the Word of God, don't you? I'm sorry, music must have drowned a jail. I believe the Word of God, don't you? Let's stand for the reading of it, if you will, please. Found in Genesis, it reads like this. Now the man and woman had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And again, she gave birth to the, his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. And Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will, you not, will you not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not well, then sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. This is the word of God. You may be seated. I'm going to go back to verse 6. There is so much, scripture, so much meat in the Scripture here today, so much theology, so many people want to argue about what's right or wrong. Today, I just want to show you very explicitly the truth of the matter, where many theologians and many commentary writers have never gotten it right because they're not looking at the Word of God here. I wish to today to proclaim to you the truth, okay? And I want you to take it and study it for yourself. And please, if I err in any way, help me learn a, more, a better way, is what Scripture says. But I believe I found out something today that I'm not apologetic for whatsoever of what the Bible says. And it really simply says this, and then, then verse 6 there, then the Lord said, the Lord said, this is Jesus talking to Cain. Yes, Jesus talking to Cain. Why are you so angry, man? What's your problem? I think that's a fair question to throw out there to you. What's your problem? What's, what's making you this way? And it's bothering you so much, everybody else sees this. He says, in fact, your countenance has fallen. You know, we're like a looking glass. We're extremely transparent. You can put on the makeup and you can comb the hair real pretty nice and neat, but it will never cover up what's inside, what's going on. You can fake a smile spot them a mile away, but you know one that's real. And you can tell when it's real when people are being real with you. I can tell some really good people when they're tired. They're just wore down. Why, the glow's a little low. They've been running a lot. They've been pushing it a lot. You can tell they're good people, but you can tell they're tired. You can tell others, man, oh man, they're just doing great. And then there's others I can spot all the way across the room, sometimes in a restaurant, saying, man, they've had a rough day. In fact, looks like they've had a rough week. Why is that? Their countenance. God says it's real simple. Why has your countenance changed? In fact, it should be good. It should be joyful. It should be bliss. You should be a happy individual. Even in the midst of worst circumstances, we should be able to hold our head up high, knowing and realizing, because of God's promises, that He's got us and He'll take us through anything. Amen? That doesn't mean we're happy about it, but what that means is we're going to be faithful to God because God's going to get us through. Amen? Now, this is how God works, okay? This is who He is, and this is what it's like. But you can't let it get you to the point where you start making bad decisions. No, it can't do that. God's saying, why are you angry? 
You shouldn't be. You should have trusted me. You should be relying on me. You should be letting me help you. You should be letting me fight some of those battles. You should be letting me answer some of those prayers. You should be letting me fight some of your giants. Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? And again, this is Jesus saying, you understand this, Cain. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Won't you be a happy, and I don't mean happy, I mean a joyous believer? Won't you be a joyous believer? Won't the majority of things you say be positive? Come on now. Won't you be spreading encouragement everywhere? I mean, in your prayers, won't you be lifting people up? If you do well, it's a choice whether you're going to do well or not. It's something you've got to decide. This is what Jesus said. Well, if you do well, things will go well for you. Actually, that's such a huge biblical promise and actually one of the first ones God gives in the Bible. And he carries it all the way through the Bible, and I'm going to prove that to you in a moment. If you'll trust him and make him first, God will take care of you. Now, let me say that again because you didn't get it. If you make God first and you trust him, he will take care of you. Amen. Yes, let's praise God. Can we do that? Yo, way too quiet. If you do well, your countenance will be lifted up. What's, what's the problem, Cain? Now, if you're not doing well, I'm just reading what it says here. Well, if you're not doing well, that means you got sin. And if you got sin, you're not in the right place. And you need to repent of it. You need to be forgiven of it. You need to be restored. Are, are you with me? Anybody out there with me? And if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. Sin wants to destroy you. The enemy wants to destroy you. The enemy wants to separate you from God. God doesn't want you to think he's a mystery. God doesn't want you to think he's some distant thing or some pagan thing you bow down and worship to. God's a loving, true, living God. He loves you. He knows you. He knows what's going on in your life, and He wants to help you. But sin of this world, and people who submit to this sin, their countenance shows they're not joyous people. They're not living under the Word of God. They're not doing the things that God says would enable him to bless you. Wouldn't you want to be a blessed person today? Anybody want to be blessed out there today? Amen. Amen. Hmm. It says here, and if you do not well, sin is crouching at the door and it's desirous for you, but you must master it. Now let me help you with this word because we really don't get a grasp of American language here of this. It says that you must rule over it. The actual Hebrew word here is masal, and the Hebrew word here is actually used back on day four of the creation when God created the firmaments in the sky to rule over the day. Nothing can block out the sun. You may not see it because of your circumstances, but the sun's still shining. Amen? Regardless where you're at, you may feel like you're in a dark world, but listen to me. The sun is still shining. Amen? The sun rules. Do you get me? The S-U-N rules. And guess what? The S-O-N rules. Do you get what I'm saying here? 
Now, you got to believe this, otherwise you're going to live in a dark world. I am telling you, you got to let the S-O-N rule in your life. And sin, you do not have to be a slave to sin. Jesus himself, in the book of Genesis early on, is saying you can rule over sin like the sun rules over the night. Now that's a holiness message. Did you get that? You must master it. You must rule over the sin of the world. How do we do that? Only through the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. But see, if you're not careful, as a believer, you'll let the world influence you sometimes and you'll start making some bad decisions. In fact, I've heard a lot of believers say they were mad at God. They were angry at God. They were upset because God wasn't answering their prayers the way they wanted them. And it's not that we ask God for our grocery list of what we want. Rather, it should be a prayer of submission to God that will give us what He wants. And it's always the best. But what will happen to you if you don't pray that prayer of submission? Well, God just said, Cain, if you do right, things will be good. But if not, sin's at your door. What will sin cause you to do? Cain was out in the field one day, probably hoeing some corn. Probably made him mad. I don't like hoeing corn. <laughs> and I was young, me and my cousin, we was told by my aunt to go out there and hoe the corn. Well, when you're a young teenager and you look out and see about an acre of corn, you just think, I'll be 21 by the time I'm finished. <laughs> I learned to hate hoeing corn. <laughs> You know, it wasn't that bad. It's just how I thought. That's how Cain was thinking. See, Cain told his brother Abel, here's what God said to me. He said, I'm mad. Why are you mad, Abel says to Cain? Well, because I I talk with God and God says, if I'm mad and I'm upset, I must have sin in my life. Abel, the younger, loving brother said this. Cain, he's right. You must have sin in your life. Nobody likes being told that. But Abel loved his brother. And he wanted his brother to be restored in countenance in this right place with God. But rather than acting out of brotherly love and hearing the voice, just like today, some of you are not paying attention, no more than man to man. See, it's your choice whether you want to hear somebody who loves you or not. Bless you. Cain told his brother, and it came about when they were in the field. Cain got so mad. Even his brother was against him. His brother wasn't against him. His brother was trying to help him. But see, it's all how you receive it. It's all how you want to take it. I'm not here preaching bad things at you. I'm trying to tell you there's a better way. God loves you. He wants your countenance to be bright. He wants things to go well in your life. In fact, it is His plan. It's His promise. I've given you every promise in the last few weeks, and I'm going to give you another huge one today, that God promised He will take care of you if you make Him first. What happens when you don't make God first? You allow your circumstances to rise up within you. 
Peter, only one of two people I ever knew, you ever, ever heard about, walked on water. And he walked on water. I've been to his house. I've been out back where he walked on water. Until he allowed his circumstances to get bigger than his God. And then he sank. Here's Abel telling his brother, Brother, I love you and you really need to do what's right. And I'm going to tell you just in a minute what he did was wrong. What he did what was wrong in order to try to help you. But Cain, instead of hearing it and taking it the right way, no, nah, it's just another one of those rules and those things in church. You preachers are all alike. Cain got so mad that he rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. That's pretty serious. How can you get to a place in your life where you're just going to let your life be surrendered to the sin of this world and no longer be a believer? We just discovered here in Scripture where choice is never taken away from you. It's always there. But God's always going to remind you of what you should be doing, living for Him. Even family members are going to tell you that we love you enough to tell you the right thing to do. What was the right thing to do? Okay, let me talk up here and give some, some huge, huge insights maybe to Scripture here. I started to say, I, I, I really can preach prophetically here just for a moment and tell you where the United States is going to be in end times in relationship with Israel. And I can answer all of that politically in the next moment here if you want to listen, okay? You think, how in the world are those two related? Whether or not, I just got your attention. Now, the man had relationships with Eve, his wife. And by the way, that's the way it's supposed to happen. There's three that believe that. Okay, I'll read it again because it's just in the book. Now, the man had relations with his wife Eve. Yes. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Can I, can I preach right there? I'm just telling you. I could, but I won't. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I've gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. That is so awesome. And again, she gave birth. First of all, let me not rush through this. Can you imagine now, here's Adam and Eve. And for the first time, now they don't have YouTube. They don't have the training at the hospital. They don't have the birthing centers. Here we got Eve for the first time. And Adam's saying, hey, Eve, you probably need to lay off some of those grapes. <laughs> you know, you're starting to, you know, put on a few extra pounds there. You know, what's happening here? Can you imagine going through the first conception where Eve begins to develop the child within and she begins to, to, to expand and the two bodies begin to grow? It's just unreal what all's talked about right here that we just assume all the time that we know and we really didn't. But again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now the word but there does not have substance to it. It's put there for our reading and our understanding. It is not meant to compare one to the other. It's the fact that one was different. One was a farber and one was a herder. Okay, that's all it means. Can we please God? Hmm. Uh, it's been several weeks back, but I have three of the cups still on my table up here. And I gave everyone a cup, and everybody had all kinds of cups. And some people still got their cups on their sinks because they want to look at it. They didn't use it, they set it there. And all those cups are different. Can we all be different and still be the children of God? Can we all look different, different heights, different sizes? Can we, can we all do that and be the children of God? And the answer is, of course we can. 
We don't all have to be loud like me, okay? You can be real quiet and, and nice and all those other things I'm not, okay? We will all be that. But we can be surrendered to God because we are the children of God. Amen? But here's some theology I want you to circle in your Bibles. It's hard to do on your phone, but you can highlight but here's some life-changing things. And I'm going to tell you, it's the first main principle in the Bible that God wants you to get that will forever change your life. And for those who don't get it, it's also in the Bible. Please look at this closely with me for just a couple of minutes. So it came about in the course of time Stop. Why did it take you a course of time? Why did you have to work your way up to it? Why didn't you just do it? I, I want to hear the, read the rest of it so you get it all. In a, it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. Do you get this? We, I, I preach what I feel like God lays on my heart. I'm not here preaching about money today. I'm preaching about you living a life that God can bless. Let me tell you something just real plain and simple. I, I don't want to get in next week's message too much. I probably won't. Let me just tell you. You need to pay close attention to this scripture. It came about in the course of time. He didn't do it first. It wasn't his priority. That Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. There is one word that is missing here that explains all theology why Cain was wrong. Why Cain missed the point. One word that is missing here that made Cain lose it all. Okay? One word that's missing. And we'll find it in the next verse. Abel, here's the next three words I want you to hear, on his part. Not Cain's part. Not Adam's part. Not Eve's part. But Abel's part. Do you hear me? Everybody has got a part that they should be giving. There, there, I mean, it's right there in Scripture. Look at it. Abel on his part. In other words, his offering. You see, everybody's got to bring their offering. Okay? And what are we going to offer? We're going to talk about that. But what I'm saying is, Abel on his part. Somebody couldn't do it for Abel. Adam and Eve couldn't do it for Abel. Cain couldn't do it for Abel. Abel couldn't do it for Cain. Abel had to bring his own part. So did Cain. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings. There's the word I want you to underline. Firstlings. Do you know what firstlings are? Let me explain. I'm not a herdsman, but I've read about it. <laughs> when sheep herders, when they're sheep, have sheep. By the way, sheep have sheep, right? Shepherds don't have sheep. Sheep have sheep, right? Now, I got that right. Sheep have sheep. Why would you sick your shepherd to have sheep? I don't understand that. You say sheep have sheep, right? If you're looking around wondering where the sheep's at, where's the sheep at? So sheep, where's the sheep? Right? Because you're supposed to be bringing the sheep, right? Shepherd don't have sheep. Sheep have sheep, right? Are you getting this anywhere? Okay. Firstlings is the first lamb that is born. Is always given to the Lord, and we'll talk about that next week just briefly. But it's the first lamb. It's not the second. It's not the third. It's not the fourth. It's the firstling. Adam, 
on his part of worshiping God, being obedient to God, also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of their fat portions when they were sacrificed. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. The Lord liked Abel and his offering. Why? Because Abel's offering was a reflection of who Abel was. And the reason God liked Abel, because Abel demonstrated who he had faith in and who he put first in his life. And he did that by the first increase that he had, the first sheep that came, he offered it to God. And God loved that and had regard for that. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Now hold it. God explained to me, preacher. Cain, it says right up there. Let's go back to verse 2. No, wrong one, sorry. Verse 3. Sound man got it wrong. Okay. That's another message, not for today. <laughs> so it came about in the course of time. Not the first thing. Not the first thing he thought about. In fact, he had it for quite a while. He thought, well, let me see here if I got something I could give God. Have you ever had food? Have you ever been around a food pounding before? That's somebody who's in need, and we want to help them, so we, everybody brings in their canned food. I don't do that around church. You know why I don't do that? Everybody wants to bring their sardines packed in mustard sauce. Because after all, they don't like sardines and mustard sauce. So instead of giving their best, they give what they don't like. I like sardines with mustard sauce with crackers, don't get me wrong. Amen. See? Smart men here. Now see, let's make sure we get this. So it came about in the course of time, not the first thing he did. Cain brought an offering. And get this. Not his first offering, not the first fruits that grew, but he brought an offering. And God says, I have no regards for Cain, nor for his offering, because it didn't come from the heart, and he didn't put me first. This is what God's saying. You must put God first. And as a sign of that, you must bring to God your first fruits. Cain did not bring his first fruits. Many people want to argue, well, it wasn't a blood sacrifice. It was just fruit of the ground. You need to read your Bible all over the place. First fruits, concept of first fruits, first offering, first born. And we'll talk just a brief moment about that later. But I'm just telling you, it is not that he was a farmer and, 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 and Abel was a herder. It has nothing to do with it. It's all right here in Scripture. Look at front of you. Abel brought his first Cain did not. That's all the theology you need to learn here for the rest of the Bible. And God's telling us back in the Genesis chapter 4 what the rest of the Bible is about. You being willing to put God first. Not when you get around to it, see if you come up with something that you could give God. There's not a reason in this world that you should not have a good countenance right now. And God loving you 
and loving your offering. Listen to me. There is not one good reason. Preacher, I haven't done that. I get you. That's in the past. Today is a new day. As I said, there's not one reason why you should not have a good countenance about you and God pour out his blessings upon you if you'll put God first. Now, how do you go from putting God first where if you don't put God first, how do you wind up not putting God first in a process of time? Oh, I'll give tidbits, but listen to this. But in the process of time, I'm even willing to kill my brother when no one's looking. That's what not giving your God, God your first will get you. That's how your life will wind up in a mess. By not putting God first. I would love to preach so much more on this subject. But it just really comes down to what are you going to worship? Are you willing to worship God and put Him first? And let me tell you something right now, because this is what you're going to make it about. I'm going to just, just, just totally blow this concept out of your mind. It has nothing to do with your finances. It has everything to do with your obedience and your relationship to God. Amen. There are so many promises I've written, given to you. Here's Abel, the younger brother who the older brother should have known better, but what he saw even in his older brother was, man, you're missing it because you're not putting God first. I don't expect the rest of the world to understand that. I wonder, I know why people go out and talk, all you churches want is money. You don't ever hear me talking about money, and I'm not talking about money today. I'm talking about you putting God first. I'll just go as far as saying this. If you would put God first, you would not worry about the money. But if all you're worried about is the money, I shouldn't say that, Tim, should I? No, you shouldn't. Just keep it. God does not need your money. He wants your heart. He wants you to be obedient so that he can pour out his blessings upon you in such a way that you're not able to contain. Get your focus off of everything else and put it back on God. Hmm. Wow. I'm just trying to help you today. To live a life where you can be blessed. And listen to me. And people all the way across the restaurant can see your countenance. God wants to bless you so much that all the way back in the book of Genesis, before he talks about anything else, he tells you, and he told Cain, Cain, if you just do well, your countenance will be great. There it is. That's the Bible. You get a choice to do well. You get a chance to be blessed. I want you to be blessed. I have a license plate on the front of my car. It's actually Brenda's car. She lets me drive it. And it says blessed. And I do not do that arrogantly. I do that proclamationally. <laughs> we are blessed people because we put God first. 
That doesn't mean our lives are easy. <laughs> Do you? I mean, a whole another story. But it means my life's in His hands. And it is today. And because of that, I can really genuinely smile because the joy of the Lord is within me. Amen? I hope and pray today you're so joyful, it's just mind-blowing. And I hope you don't try to drag this out a long time to try to decide, because let me tell you, if you do that, you probably won't. You just need to make a decision to make God first in every area of your life. Amen.